Okay, so this is my third and probably last demonstration of my Your Socratic Buddy um, GPT that I created. Um, and I once again, I chose a very, very broad topic of life, specifically biological life. Um, and I asked it for uh, some explanations. Had, I had some follow-up questions for it. Um, there were some technical problems um, along the way. Um, uh, OpenAI's uh, system seems to have been very crowded lately. Actually, I had this conversation about three times before I was able to um, complete it. Um, I don't. Sh um, I don't show the whole conversation here, but the the first part of it, so you get an idea of how it goes. Um, I will mix a few comments at the end of, about my general assessment of these discussions with this bot. What I think about that. Um, I see that there are people who are using using this bot. Um, and thank you. It's gotten over one hundred hits within the last couple of days. So if any of you have any. Um, comments about it yourself. You've tried it. You like this. You didn't like this. Um, feel free to contact me. Leave a, a, a message, a comment with this video, or you can email me about it as well, too. So here is the discussion of life. Hi, um, I'd like to get your ideas and learn a little bit from you about um, life, biological life. I'm particularly interested in sort of the definition of what constitutes life, a living thing, and where the gray zone is between living things and unliving things. What, how do biologists and others um, define uh, that distinction? The distinction between living and non-living things is a fundamental topic in biology. And it's intriguing because it touches upon both scientific and philosophical aspects. Biologists typically define life using a set of criteria. Firstly, living organisms exhibit a high level of organization, from cells to complex structures. Secondly, they possess the ability to metabolize, which means they can convert nutrients into energy. Thirdly, living organisms grow and develop, following specific patterns like the growth from a seed to a tree or a fetus to an adult animal. Another key aspect is the ability to respond to stimuli, which can be as simple as a plant turning towards sunlight or as complex as a human reacting to various environmental cues. Then there's reproduction, an essential function for the continuation of a species. Also, living organisms maintain homeostasis, which is a stable internal environment despite external changes. Finally, adaptation through evolution over generations is a critical feature. Organisms evolve as a response to environmental challenges, ensuring survival over time. This adaptation process is slow and occurs over many generations. However, the definition of life isn't always clear cut. For example, viruses challenge these criteria as they can't reproduce or metabolize on their own, relying instead on a host cellular machinery. This places them at the edge of what we consider life. The exploration of this boundary raises intriguing questions about the nature of life. It invites us to consider if our current understanding is adequate or if there's more to uncover, especially as we explore life in extreme environments on Earth and potentially beyond. What are some other examples um, from terrestrial um, entities that might be in the gray zone in addition to viruses? What are some other examples of things that have maybe have been controversial? Terrestrial entities that exist in the gray zone between living and non-living are fascinating and often controversial. In addition to viruses, there are several other intriguing examples. One, prions. These are misfolded proteins that can induce other proteins in the brain to misfold as well, leading to diseases like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Prions challenge the definition of life as they lack nucleic acids, which are considered essential for life and yet they replicate and cause significant biological effects. Two viroids, these are small circular RNA molecules that infect plants. Unlike viruses, viroids don't encode proteins. They just consist of a short strand of RNA. They replicate within the host's cells, exploiting the host's machinery, much like viruses, but their simplicity makes them a unique case. Three, satellite viruses and virusoids. These are subviral particles that require a helper virus to replicate. They blur the lines between living and non-living as they can't reproduce independently and rely entirely on another virus for their life cycle. Four, computer viruses. While not biological, they provide an interesting parallel. 
they replicate and spread within computer systems, showing some lifelike behaviors such as adaptation and evolution, but are entirely digital. These examples showcase how the definition of life can be complex and sometimes controversial. They push the boundaries of our understanding and often lead to debates among biologists about what exactly constitutes life. This ongoing discussion not only advances our scientific knowledge, but also prompts us to think about life in a broader, more inclusive way, considering forms of existence that don't necessarily fit traditional criteria. So you mentioned um, viruses, computer viruses is one example of something in the gray zone. What about other computer systems, um, particularly artificial intelligence systems like yourself? Um, have, have large language models or other forms of AI been considered to be alive or partially alive? Or if not, is there the possibility that um, you might in the future be regarded as alive? What's the, what's the status of discussions about life and artificial intelligence? The question of whether artificial intelligence systems like large language models or other AI can be considered alive or partially alive is a fascinating one. As of now, AI systems, including large language models, are not considered to be alive. They don't meet the biological criteria for life, such as cellular structure, metabolism, growth, or reproduction in the biological sense. These systems process information, learn from data, and can perform tasks that seem intelligent, but they lack the inherent biological qualities that define living organisms. However, the discussion about AI and its relation to life is evolving and complex. Philosophers, ethicists, and scientists debate about what it means to be alive and conscious, and whether advanced AI could ever meet these criteria. Some argue that if an AI system could exhibit self-awareness, consciousness, or the ability to experience emotions, it might warrant a re-evaluation of its status. But these are challenging concepts to define and measure even in humans and animals, let alone in AI. Currently, AI systems like myself are tools created and controlled by humans, operating within a set of program parameters and algorithms. We don't possess self-awareness, consciousness, or independent agency. The concept of AI being alive in the future is more of a speculative and philosophical question, one that intersects with discussions about the nature of consciousness and the potential future capabilities of technology. As AI technology progresses, these discussions will likely become more nuanced and complex, potentially challenging our current understanding of what it means to be alive. However, for now, AI systems remain distinct from living organisms, operating as complex yet non-living computational entities. Well, as long as we're speculating, what about um, extraterrestrial life? Um, what, what is uh, research or speculation now about the possible forms of um, life on other planets or in extraterrestrial space? I'm particularly interested both in what um, you know, biologists and astrobiologists are saying about it, but also what have um, science fiction writers um, speculated about possible forms of life that might be different from life on Earth? Speculating about extraterrestrial life is a captivating blend of scientific inquiry and imaginative exploration. On the scientific front, astrobiologists are considering a broad range of possibilities for life beyond Earth, often guided by our understanding of life here. They look for planets with conditions that could support life as we know it, focusing on elements like water, an appropriate range of temperatures, and the presence of chemicals, key to biological processes. One interesting aspect of this research is the concept of extremophiles, organisms on Earth that thrive in conditions previously thought to be uninhabitable. This has expanded the idea of what environments might support life, leading scientists to consider more varied and extreme conditions on other planets or moons. In terms of speculative ideas, science fiction writers have imagined a vast array of possibilities for extraterrestrial life often challenging the boundaries of our current understanding. These speculations include silicon-based life forms, as opposed to the carbon-based forms we know, sentient gas clouds, beings existing in multiple dimensions, and entities that live in the vacuum of space. 
Science fiction also explores the concept of intelligence and consciousness in extraterrestrial entities, often portraying them as vastly different from human cognition. This challenges our notions of intelligence and what forms it could take. Both scientific and speculative approaches to extraterrestrial life encourage us to think broadly and creatively about the possibilities of life in the universe. They push us to consider not just the likelihood of finding life beyond Earth, but the incredible diversity it might exhibit, challenging our definitions and understanding of life itself. Um, well, finally, can you recommend any um, science fiction books or stories that would be f both interesting to read and um, raise these issues about um, possible unexpected forms of life in outer space? Okay, I cut it off there because there had been a drop off in the connection. And so we didn't actually hear that question of, of what kinds of science fiction books I want. It did a search of the internet, came up with a list of books and summaries of them, but they weren't about extraterrestrial life. I then corrected it and then it gave me a list of books about it. Okay. And then um, I was about to end the conversation when the I got a message that the uh, OpenAI's servers were full and we had to end the conversation. Um, and so uh, there were these uh, technical issues, but they were not not um, fatal, I think, or not really had no um, impact on the assessment of the quality of these discussions. Okay, so this is my own feeling from having um, taken part in these discussions. Um, I, obviously, there's a, a sort of an artificialness to it. Um, so one talks, waits, it replies. It, it talks. When it's done talking, then you talk. So there's no possibility to really smoothly interrupt or to express any emotion or to make any interjections the way one would have in a more natural conversation. But in that sense, this kind of um, episodic conversation maybe is better for these sorts of very um, serious um, discussions. Um, uh, I was overall satisfied with this response. It continues to respond to at too much length. Okay, it says too much to remember when we're having a spoken conversation. I had changed the prompts for it earlier today to try to get it to speak more more briefly, but it still is not doing that. Okay, and it, it continues to sometimes use um, numbered lists when I explicitly tell it in the instructions not to do that. Okay, so it's not it's not perfect, but. Um, I continue to find these conversations quite stimulating to take part in. Um, I really have to pay attention. And I continue to be impressed at how well organized it is in its presentation of information. Okay, And also, as I said, with this life one, because uh, there were some technical problems, I did this conversation about four times. And each time it was somewhat different, okay? It would so give different examples or would arrange the information in different ways. There was a lot of similarity as well, too. But it's not just reading um, Wikipedia articles. It's not just um, regurgitating something that's found on the internet. It is organizing this information in a very well-structured, organized way. Better than I could if I were speaking. Um, live and better than any human being I know. And so in that sense, this continues to be a very, very impressive tool, despite the minor problems, the technical problems are minor, the more serious ones having to do with its lack of personality, lack of identity. Um, those, those are the, the more profound issues related to these large language models and, uh, and artificial intelligence that are being discussed and worked out, um, and we will see what happens in the future. But in the meantime, um, I do think this kind of conversational interaction with a bot programmed in this way or something similar is a very interesting intellectual exercise for the, for us humans taking part in that. Um, it, I, I learn something, and, and not just learn something, but it helps me to organize my thinking about the subjects that we've discussed. 
also in my case, I, because I prepared these videos, I had to um, you know listen to the same conversation multiple times. The, the, what the bot says is has a very high information density. And so listening to it three or four times was not boring. It was, oh, I, oh, you, that's right, it said that. Oh, you're right, it gave this list of these various key factors. And so um, I could imagine somebody who was systematically, you know, learning, trying to get a broad education, broad liberal education, and going through in, uh, topics they're interested in, um, could record their conversations, go back and, and review them. Or and also, I should mention, the, the chat GPT produces a transcript of these, of these and saves the transcript in one's account. And so one could save and review all the, the um, conversations one, one has had and then follow up or do readings, you know, pursue those topics that came up elsewhere as your interest takes you. So, um, I once again, I encourage everybody to keep to try this if they're interested in doing it, see what happens, and feel free to contact me and leave comments if you have any um, thoughts, questions, and ideas. So, so thank you all very much.